Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so many of you know that I have a general ophthalmology practice in addition to my neuro ophthalmology practice, and I've tried to tailor this lecture to be more practical for people who are going to be comprehensive ophthalmologists and not targeted towards a neuro ophthalmology um, audience. This is really about the kinds of headaches and eye pain stuff that I see come into my comprehensive ophthalmology clinic and that I think would be of practical value to someone who's going to be a comprehensive ophthalmologist. Uh, that seems like there was something else I wanted to say about it. Oh, a lot of this stuff doesn't show up on OCAPs that I'm aware of, and so this is really not about studying for the OCAPs. This is really about practically helping people in clinic. And some of this material was stolen from Dr. Degree. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so we're going to review some of the uh, headache syndromes that can present with ocular and visual symptoms, because that's the kind of stuff that comes into your clinic. My intention is not, my, not to make you headache experts, but just enough information so that you can make the correct diagnosis and send the patient out with an appropriate workup or an appropriate referral. And then uh, not to forget the treatment that's administered by ear. So just telling somebody that like, okay, this aura that you're having is a, it's a thing. It doesn't mean that you're having a seizure. It doesn't mean you're having a stroke. It doesn't mean you have a brain tumor. Uh, and and your eyes okay and, and this isn't going to damage your visual system like that that are often like it's really hard to know sometimes what patients agenda what their agenda is like somebody could come in with an aura and you could say oh your eye exam's normal everything's good see you later you know and you think you've done your job because they were worried something was wrong with their eye and you told them that there's not but that leaves them still well then what the hell was it you know so so sometimes just telling the patient that there's a name for what they have that other people have what they have that they haven't damaged their eye, that they're not, they don't have something more serious can be incredibly um, uh, therapeutic. Uh, so, so headache is incredibly common. Uh, even kids have headaches, even kids get migraines. Um, there's probably 10 to 20% of us are genetically predisposed to getting headaches. And headache is an incredibly common reason for any kind of uh, visit to a doctor, including to uh, an eye doctor and headaches you know aren't just head pain they cause missed work loss of income missing social activities missing church missing school like they really have beyond just having pain like these things really affect people's lives uh, so why would somebody with a headache go to the eye doctor well number one it's very common so like just in your ordinary practice about 6% of men and 18% of women, that's one out of five women coming through your office for whatever reason, probably have migraine. And then like, lot, I hear this all the time, people you know, are getting headaches and maybe it's at work and they think that, gee, maybe glasses would, would help, which you know, I can count on one hand the number of times that's been true, but, but people have this thing in their mind that, well, gee, maybe if I just had glasses, I'd feel better. And then also primary and secondary headaches can cause eye pain and they can also cause visual symptoms like aura, which I just mentioned, and then photophobia is another reason why somebody with migraine might go to the eye doctor because their eyes are light sensitive and so they assume something's wrong with their eye. And then also some of the primary and secondary headaches can have autonomic features that involve the eye. It can affect the eyelid. It can cause changes in the size of the pupil. It can cause, some of them can cause injection of the eye during the headache syndrome, and some of the headache syndromes can cause tearing. So again, people have a headache, they have these associated eye symptoms, they assume that something might be wrong with their eye, so they go to the eye doctor. Um, so uh, you'll see that it's not too surprising that people with headaches uh, will, go, will have eye pain, and that has to do with the innervation of the eye. Uh, so the eye and the orbit are richly innervated by the trigeminal nerve, and the trigeminal nerve is, of course, the nerve that's implicated in migraine pathogenesis. So, it, you know, just like some, I explain to people sometimes, like people that are having a heart attack will sometimes complain of left arm pain. Was there anything wrong with their arm? No, it's just the way we're wired, and it just feels like we have arm pain. There's nothing wrong with our arm. 
And the same can be true of migraine. Sometimes a trigeminal nerve gets irritated in migraine and you get eye or eye pain. Does it mean there's eye or eye socket pain? Does it mean there's something wrong with your eye or your orbit? No, it's just, it's just the way we're wired. And then also from a, a study that was done, if you stimulate different points of the dura in the, you know, the lining of the brain, you can get referred pain to all these different points along your head, eye, and face. And so you can see that there are several points in the meninges where stimulation at that point causes pain right around the eye. And so again, this is just the way we're wired. You know, Sometimes if the dura is, is uh, irritated as part of migraine pathogenesis, because it's also innervated by the trigeminal nerve, you can get referred pain around your eye and your orbit. Uh, so primary headache disorders like migraine and tension type headache make up the vast majority of headache syndromes. There are some other secondary headache syndromes, in other words, headaches that are caused by something other than a primary headache syndrome, like brain tumors, subarachnoid hemorrhages, you know, intracranial pressure, giant cell arteritis, those make up a relatively small fraction of the headache syndromes. So primary headache is, even though these these ones down here, the secondary headache disorders, are the scarier ones. They make up a smaller portion of the overall headache population. Okay, so let's talk about this lady. So does anybody have a guess to what her diagnosis is? Right, it's just this is a very typical story in my clinic. She's come in because she, the pain's concentrated over her eye, so she's worried something's wrong with one or both of her eyes, but her eye exam is normal. It sounds like migraine. Uh, so how can you make, quickly make the diagnosis of migraine? Well, there are these three questions that you can ask, and if they answer positively to two out of three, there's like a 90% chance that, you're, that, you know, that you've picked up a migraine. So you can say, oh, are your headaches or your eye pain. So you have to you'd be careful sometimes. If you, if you say, are your headaches ever associated with light sensitivity? She'll say, well, I don't have a headache. I have pain in my eye. So you, just the way you word things, pe people get fussy. So have your headaches ever been associated with light sensitivity? And then sometimes I give them an example, like when your eye's hurting, is it, you know, does it make it worse to like be outside? Um, uh, do you, does your headache or pain, is it ever associated with nausea or an upset stomach? Um, and then have your, has this pain or your headache ever caused you to have to change what you were doing that day, like miss work or miss school or miss a social activity? And so th this is called the ID migraine questionnaire, and it's been shown to be very sensitive. So if, if there's like only three things you can remember about migraine, these are the three things to remember. Uh, but it's, you know, nothing's 100%, and some of these patients still have migraine even if they answer positively to only one of these questions. And so some other things that have, I've kind of learned from Dr. Digri over the years is to ask about a family history. Um, so uh, but the problem is, is often, uh, in my experience in my general ophthalmology clinic, is that often migraine is uh, misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. And so a lot of people, either aren't aware of their family history because they just don't know, or because, um, because people, there are people in their family with migraine, they just don't know it. Um, and so one of the questions I'll ask is, when you were a kid, do you remember your mom being sick with a headache? Because females are more likely to have migraine in the family, so I think it's sometimes more helpful to ask about female family members. And then uh, I hear about sinus headaches all the time, and 99% of the time that means migraine. It, it, and people think it's, again, they think it's their sinuses because the pain's here or here or here, and that's where their sinuses are. So they assume there's something wrong with their sinuses. Uh, and then also asking about car sickness. So uh, kids who are car sick are often have migraine as adults. And uh, that can be an incredibly helpful question. Actually, some of my migraine patients are still car sick. Very, you know, uh, motion sickness is a common uh, migraine personality trait, I guess. And then also, some some kids who have who are going to go on to develop migraine as adults will often have episodic belly pain as a kid. You know, gassy, crampy, unexplained belly pain, 
and some people think this is like a, a childhood manifestation of migraine. Maybe some effect on the enteric nervous system that's migraine-like. And then some of the other migraine characteristics that you can sometimes ask about if you think somebody has migraine and you're trying to, you know, uh, pin down the diagnosis. Because, right, it's a clinical diagnosis, right? You can't get an x-ray or a blood test that says you have migraine, so you have to do it based on, really based on your history. Um, so we talked about nausea and vomiting. We talked about light sensitivity. Some people also have sound sensitivity, phonophobia. And so when I ask about light sensitivity or sound sensitivity, I'll say, you know, when you're having this headache or this pain, like and somebody was watching TV, would you tell them to turn it down? You know, and sometimes that's a, um, a sign of uh, an associated symptom of migraine. Uh, the fact that the pain is unilateral and that it has sort of a throbbing quality also is kind of like more migrainey. And then some sort of a aura that precedes the headache and, you know, far and away the most common form of aura is some sort of visual disturbance. Uh, but some people will get an olfactory aura. They'll smell like a, like a bad smell or a chemical kind of smell before they get a headache that no one else can smell. Uh, uh, and rarely, you know, people can get confusion or even aphasia and other neurologic symptoms as part of their migraine uh, symptomology. Like uh, some, uh, uh, my uncle actually has this, and he, he was driving in a very, in a part of town that he's very familiar with. He grew up there, and like all of a sudden he didn't know where he was going or what he was doing there. And um, he, you know, he had to be worked up for stroke because these symptoms are very stroke-like. But in the end, it turned out to be, you know, a migraine. And then uh, sometimes uh, people will have like very specific uh, aphasias that are, are very stroke-like or TIA-like, uh, but it turns out to be migraine. Uh, and these can, these are very tough people to take care of. Certainly, way beyond what we want to discuss today. But I just want you to be aware that people with migraine can have these funny, almost stroke-like symptoms as part of their uh, symptomology. Uh, migraine, you know, visual migraine auras take on all kinds of crazy um, uh, forms. Uh, spots and dots, people will talk about broken glass, prisms, colored lights. You know, most patients aren't going to use the word scintillating scotoma, even though that's, you know, kind of what they, they have. So you have to use more, um, uh, like, lay language when you're asking about any sort of a visual disturbance that precedes their headache or their pain. Uh, psychiatric comorbidities, very common with uh, migraine, and they kind of have like a vicious cycle. They play on each other, like the headaches make your anxiety worse because you're worried you have a brain tumor, and that makes your headaches worse, and that makes your anxiety worse. And you know, and lo a lot of times these people need um, uh, treatment for both facets of their problem in order to get them under control. Uh, there's uh, not infrequently a history of neglect or abuse in childhood in some of these patients, especially the women. And then uh, there are uh, some of these uh, triggers are really common with people with migraine and eye, and eye pain that's migranous in nature. Uh, not enough sleep, skipping meals, stress, too much caffeine. Uh, some people are set off by certain smells. Some people are very sensitive to perfumes and stuff. Some people are sensitive to certain kinds of light, like maybe fluorescent lights. And then medication overuse, like so that a lot of these people are often overusing over-the-counter analgesics like Tylenol and naproxen and ibuprofen, and that gets them into this vicious, you know, medication overuse headache, rebound headache situation. Uh, caffeine is sometimes used for migraine treatment, like uh, if you go to the drugstore and you buy Excedrin migraine, it's Tylenol, aspirin, and caffeine. Uh, uh, but also, like if people, uh, but caffeine can also trigger or worsen headaches. It's, it's kind of a fine balance with people. So it's usually a change in their habits. Like if they were big caffeine drinkers and then all of a sudden they're not drinking caffeine, it can make them pretty sick. And if they're light caffeine users and all of a sudden they're not sleeping, so they're drinking a lot of caffeine to stay awake, that can also set people off. Uh, I'm going to just talk briefly about uh, medication overuse headache because it is something I see commonly in these people that are coming in to see me for eye pain or pain around their eyes, that they're overusing uh, medications and, that's, and that even though the primary problem might have gone, like now the thing has just been perpetuated by their overuse of medication. 
And so people who are using uh, ergots, opiates, or triptans 10 or more days out of the month are very likely to be in rebound. Simple analgesics like uh, acetaminophen, aspirin, naproxen, uh, they're, you know, if they're using that 15 or more days per month, they're very likely gotten into trouble with medication overuse. And this can be really hard to treat. You know, these people need to be put on some sort of prophylactic medication and then withdrawn from the medication that they're overusing. And again, this is beyond the scope of today's lecture. And you just want to recognize it in clinic, you know, like ask somebody, well, what are you taking for these headaches? And how often are you taking it? And, and then you can say, well, gee, you know, you might be having rebound headaches, medication overuse headaches. We really need to get you into a neurologist or a headache specialist to help you get better because this isn't going to get better until you stop overusing these medications. Uh, so I'd say prophylactic, prophylactic medications, I would leave that to headache specialists and neurologists. You know, if that's something you want to learn about, that's definitely something we can teach you about uh, in neuroophthalmology, but I don't think it's part of the purview of a general ophthalmologist. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, if you're re uh, recommending to somebody abortive medications, over-the-counter analgesics can be very helpful for some people. Um, some people's migraines are very well treated with uh, naproxen. Um, Excedrin migraine is available over-the-counter. Again, that's t aspirin, acetaminophen, and caffeine. Uh, it, there's usually generic combinations that are um, available at the store that are pretty cheap. Alka-Seltzer some people like because it kind of settles your stomach. And because some of these people usually have a little tummy upset at the same time, that can be good. Um, but then in terms of prescription drugs, uh, Midrin, which is uh, known by many other trade names, but it's this combination of uh, acetaminophen, dichlorophenazone, and isomethyptine. One of these is sort of, like a, sort of like a stimulant, and the other one is sort of like a mild sedative. They kind of balance each other out, and for some reason this combination seems to help some people. It is Schedule 5. It's a controlled substance, a substance for reasons that I'm not aware of. But it's not an addictive drug, but it can be overused. Any of these medications can be overused. And so if you're going to suggest these or prescribe these, you just want to make sure that people are aware that they can't use them more than a certain amount per month without making things worse. Uh, triptans, um, like Imitrex and all the other triptan-like drugs, ergots are pretty rarely used. I've never, they kind of scare me. They're, they're kind of old drugs, and they're definitely effective, but they can be a little bit sketchy in people with heart disease. And then, you know, people that get um, nausea with their headaches, you really need to treat the nausea before you can treat the headache. And so um, I really like metoclopramide. It kind of helps their stomach move a little bit, relieves their nausea, and then they can take something for, for their headache. Because some of these medications, like you can imagine, like if you have an upset stomach, taking a couple of ibuprofen is probably not going to help that very much. And you really need to deal with the nausea before you can take some of these medications, again, without making yourself worse. So don't forget about antiemetics. Uh, you know, some people aren't into taking medications. And um, so, uh, and even the people that are, like sometimes lifestyle modification can be really helpful in reducing their headaches uh, syndromes. And sometimes these are, these are things that people know they're not supposed to do. They know they're not supposed to get stressed out. They know they're supposed to get enough sleep. They're not supposed to drink too much caffeine. They're not supposed to, they know this stuff, but sometimes some needs to tell it to them. You know, you really shouldn't do that because that's making you worse. I know, I know. And then uh, I'm a big believer in some non-traditional treatments for some people and you can laugh if you want like you know some of this stuff has some good like peer-reviewed literature behind it and some of it doesn't but sometimes these things can be really helpful for some people especially people who are sensitive to medications who don't like taking medications um, physical therapy of the head and neck you know, you know if especially if you send them to a therapist who has a specific interest in headache um, can be super helpful uh, uh, you know I uh, I'm sure Dr. Diggory is wincing, but sometimes chiropractors can adjust somebody's neck and, and, and really relieve their headaches. Actually, my former secretary, not my current secretary, but my former secretary uh, had a lot of migraines. She was very medication sensitive, and uh, she ended up finding a chiropractor in Sugar House who's really helped her a lot and has been able to not only help her manage her headaches, but keep her off medication. Uh, uh, acupuncture and again you know like there's good acupuncturists out there and there's bad ones you just need to find a good one 
Massage therapy can be super helpful. It helps with stress management. It helps relieve some of the muscle spasms in the sternocleidomastoid and some of these uh, spinal, you know, neck muscles up here, which can be really important triggers for some people. And then I'm just going to talk briefly about photophobia management because, you know, almost everybody with migraine will tell you that they're light sensitive during a headache. Many of them will tell you that certain kinds of light will trigger a headache. And then there's some people with migraine that are chronically light sensitive. And these people also will end up in your clinic because they think there's something wrong with their eyes. And one of the funny things about the particular photophobia associated with migraine, as well as blepharospasm and traumatic brain injury, is that it's often non-incandescent artificial light that bugs people. You know, they go outside and where you would think their light sensitivity would be worse, you know, on a bright sunny day, but they throw on a pair of sunglasses and they're really pretty much okay. But it's the indoor artificial light that sets these people off. Fluorescent lights, these gas discharge lights, these are the lights you see like in a big box store on the roof of like Lowe's or Home Depot or Costco. They have kind of a funny, if you've ever looked up at them, they're gigantic and they're super bright. They have, they have kind of a funny color to them, either an orangey kind of color or a bluish kind of color to them. And they're super um, efficient, right? They don't use a lot of electricity, they don't create a lot of heat, but they create a lot of light and that's why the stores use them. But for reasons that we don't quite understand completely, people with migraine can find those lights very uncomfortable. They have a hard time going into those stores. And then computer screens, you know, which are like, you know, ubiquitous now, uh, uh, can really set some people off. And I, this is why I think it is so, like there's no proof behind this, but if you look at the solar um, emission of the sun, let's see. It's kind of a nice Gaussian curve that sort of peaks, you know, has like a nice peak and a nice slope, uh, you know, of a red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And if you look at the at the sensitivity of the human eye, it sort of mirrors the, sense the spectrum of the sun, which I think makes sense, because that's probably, you know, our eyes evolved over millions of years under the sun, and I think it has evolved to be most sensitive to the wavelengths of light that are emitted by the sun. If you look at the transmission spectrum of an incandescent light, which is here says uh, tungsten light, because remember, an uh, incandescent bulb has a tungsten filament in it. It's also fairly Gaussian across the visible spectrum. It has kind of a nice smooth uh, peak to it, and that's because it's a burning filament, just like the sun is a burning filament. And so the spectrum emitted by that burning filament is kind of sun-like, and I think that's why people with migraine prefer incandescent lights. If you look at the spectrum of fluorescent lights, they're very spiky. Because of the nature of the chemicals that are used in fluorescent lights, they emit very strongly at certain wavelengths and then not at all at other wavelengths. And with some of the modern engineering, you know, the more modern fluorescent lights have become better at, at being less spiky, but that, that characteristic is, is still there in any kind of a non-incandescent artificial light. And I think that bugs people with uh, with migraine. The reason we think it bugs these people is because of this class of cells in the vertebrate retina called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And I don't know if this information has made it into, made it into the BCSC yet, but about 1% of your retinal ganglion cells, the cells that send their axons out to the lateral geniculate nucleus, about 1% of them don't send their axons to the lateral geniculate nucleus. They go to other important places in your brain. So one of the places they go is to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which you might remember is where your body's 24-hour clock is located. So um, it's these cells being activated by light that synchronize your suprachiasmatic nucleus and keep it on track with the local uh, time change. It's these cells that resynchronize your clock when you travel overseas. Um, these cells also send their axons to the pretectal nucleus over here in the brain stem where they then hook up with the Edinger-Westphal nucleus, which you'll remember is where the pupillary center is, right? So it's these cells being stimulated by light that uh, stimulate the Edinger-Westphal nucleus. 
and constrict your pupil. So these cells are important for pupillary constriction. Uh, that's it's um, probably why some people who are blind, like say from a photoreceptor degeneration, still have a pupillary light response because these cells are still working. And then these cells uh, from work from uh, done by Dr. Digri in uh, conjunction with Rami Burstein at Harvard uh, has, has shown that these cells, at least in rats, send projections to the posterior thalamus. That's what the PO here is. And that's an important pain center in the thalamus. And so it's thought that when we look at a light that's too bright, like when we look at the sun and it physically hurts, I think it's these cells that are being stimulated and it's this part of your brain that's being stimulated that turns that light, transforms it into a, into a noxious signal. And it's, it's a, probably a protective mechanism, so it's a pretty fundamentally old part of our eye that keeps us from damaging our eye. The funny thing about these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells is that you might have noticed from their name that they don't need, although they do get input from rods and cones, they don't require inputs from rods and cones in order to be activated. They have a photopigment in them called melanopsin, which is isomerized by light, just like rhodopsin and conopsins. And, it's, and that isomerization can stimulate these cells. So in some of our patients who have photoreceptor degenerations, these cells still respond to light. They don't give you vision, you can't see with them, but they can still um, keep your suprachiasmatic nucleus synchronized, they can still constrict your pupil, and they can still cause pain. Uh, melanopsin is uh, most sensitive at a wavelength of about 480 nanometers. So if you look at the sensitivity of uh, the wavelength sense, so I've plotted, so wavelength is plotted on the bottom here. So here's red cones, which are maximally sensitive, you know, like around uh, uh, 560 or so. Then you've got green cones, which are a slightly shorter wavelength. Then rhodopsin, the photopigment that's in rods. And then there's a big gap over to blue cones, which are more, more sensitive, like around 400, 400 nanometers. And then you see that OPN4 that's just off of rhodopsin. That's the melanopsin peak. So the melanopsin, melanopsin is most sensitive at a wavelength of about 480 nanometers. It's about halfway between green and blue. Um, Uh, and, I, and I think that it's uh, light that's emitted around 480 nanometers by some of these artificial light sources that bugs people with migraine because those cells which are hooking up to pain centers in your brain are maximally sensitive at that wavelength. Matter of fact, if you look at this little diagram from a, from a fluorescent bulb, you can see there's a pretty strong peak right here at 480. Uh, so for some of our patients who are coming in who have this indoor light sensitivity, a lot of them will wear sunglasses indoors because it's the only way that they can function. And you really need to dissuade them from that because I, they're light, they're dark adapting their retina. And, they're actually, and so then when they do take their glasses off or they do go outside, their light sensitivity is going to be worse. And the example that I often use for people is I say, you know what it's like when you go to a matinee movie and you're watching the movie and then you, you come out the exit doors into the bright sunlight, how painful that is. And like, that's what it's gonna be like when you take these glasses off or when you go outside. So I try to, I say it's fine to wear them outside, as dark as you want, but indoors don't do that. And instead I try to talk people into FL41 because it seems to be more effective than other stuff that you can buy in the store and it's not expensive and it's easily applied to glasses or contact lenses. Uh, it has kind of a rose color uh, compared to a pair of like ordinary gray sunglasses. It has kind of a pinkish, rose, reddish kind of color to it. If you look at the transmission spectrum of a gray, pair of gray sunglasses versus a pair of FL41, uh, you'll notice that FL41 has this pretty strong dip right around 580 nanometers, right around the same wavelength where melanopsin is maximally sensitive. So. FL41 was actually developed like 20 years before anybody knew about intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells or the, uh, or the spectrum of melanopsin. Um, uh, it was 
developed empirically by trying different sorts of tints on people with light sensitivity until they found something that worked. But I don't think it's a coincidence. I think there's something uh, intrinsically better about FL41 because it's blocking those wavelengths of light uh, that stimulate intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells and, and, and appear to make people with migraine less comfortable. And again, it's super cheap. The Moran Eye Center sells it. Our contact lens shop can get contact lenses <coughs> tinted with it. Um, you're not going to kill anybody with FL41. And you can, and it's really, like the first time I started prescribing this to people, um, people would come back and say, oh my God, you know, this was, you know, I can go back to work, I can go back to school, I can go to church. And you're like, really? Like it just, it just sounded like, I was, I was really, really surprised and continue to be surprised by how helpful it can be to certain people. It's a very simple, inexpensive thing. Um, so there's, you know, so of course diseases of the eye and the eye socket can also cause headache and eye pain, and that's really part of your job as an ophthalmologist is to, is to rule those things out. Uh, but most of them luckily are pretty obvious to us with all of our special exam tools. Like if somebody has an inflammatory condition of the cornea, conjunctiva, sclera, or iris, we're, we're going to pick that up on our exam. You know, it's, it's a lot more difficult for neurologists who are often treating these people to rule out these things um, because they don't have the tools we do. And then also orbital inflammation like thyroid eye disease, uh, a fistula. You know, usually there are other signs and symptoms that are going to be present in that patient that are going to tip you off to the fact that this is not some primary headache syndrome, but right, it really is an eye problem. And we all, and, you know, we all know how to take care of those things or how to work them up. Uh, but then there are some patients that don't have any obvious inflammation in their eye that can also have a secondary eye pain uh, syndrome, uh, like eye strain, you know, so that, you know, asthenopia, you know, is the term that we use. So, of course, if somebody is coming into your clinic and complaining of eye pain, that's primarily when they're at work and when they're reading, when they're working on the computer, you want to make sure they don't have like latent hyperopia or convergence insufficiency. Uh, posterior scleritis can be very tricky, best found by uh, ultrasound. Um, will not be obvious on your examination. It's fortunately not very common. Uh, usually these patients have pain on eye movement that helps you, you know, raises your index of suspicion for some sort of a orbital cause rather than a primary headache syndrome. Uh, early on in optic neuritis, people can have eye pain, but you know, I've seen a bunch of patients over the years referred to me for optic neuritis who just have eye pain and no vision loss, and that just doesn't happen. Like, people don't, you know, if to have optic neuritis, you've got to have vision loss. Uh, but for some reason, that's especially pain on eye movement, which can be caused by so many things, will sometimes make people immediately jump to optic neuritis even when there's no vision loss. But early on, you could have pain, you know preceding the vision loss by hours or maybe up to a day. Uh, idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome we'll talk about a little bit more because this is another important cause of eye pain. Um, uh, angle closure, of course, something that we wouldn't want to miss. And then, you know, zoster is something that I see, you know, fairly frequently in my general clinic. And um, before the rash comes out, it can be really hard to diagnose. If people come in with, you know, horrible pain in the dis you know, it's unilateral, it's in the distribution of V1, usually if they're coming into the eye doctor. And um, uh, sometimes you, you don't exactly know what's going on until the rash breaks out, and then you're like, okay, now I know what it is. So just a quick uh, talk about idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome, also known as orbital pseudotumor. So this condition is, a, is really, it's kind of a garbage can term for any sort of a unexplained idiopathic inflammation that affects any of the contents of the orbit. So it can affect the muscles, it can affect the optic nerve sheath, it can affect the lacrimal gland, and you know, if you, if you suspect that, especially in somebody who has pain on eye movement, what I'll do in clinic is I'll take like a little cotton tip applicator and I'll gently touch, I'll kind of rub over the superior rectus insertion uh, through the closed eyelid, over the lateral rectus insertion, the medial rectus insertion, the inferior rectus insertion, the trochlea, and just ask them, is it tender here, is it tender here, and compare it to the other side that's not symptomatic. And sometimes that can tip you off to a, a case of myositis. Uh, orbital ultrasound can be super helpful. 
because uh, Roger Harry can measure all the muscles and compare them side to side and tell you if one of them's inflamed. And it's usually treatable with non-steroidal uh, analgesics. And um, you know, we, um, it's kind of beyond. This is really an orbital lecture, you know, about the th different things that can cause this syndrome and, and the appropriate workup. But uh, non-steroidal analgesics are, are a, a very good treatment. Uh, trochleitis is something that I don't see too commonly. You can see that it showed up here in this patient on the CT scan. Uh, you know, again, by palpating over the trochlea, uh, you can make this diagnosis. And it's caused by inflammation of the tendon, the superior oblique tendon, where it goes through the trochlea. And it's uh, more common in patients with some of these uh, connective tissue uh, diseases. And then, you know, I don't think we have to talk a whole lot about uh, glaucoma. Just remember that some drugs can cause this and that, you know, farsightedness is a big risk factor. Uh, this is a nice little statistic down here that uh, 11 out of 2,000 patients with headache were misdiagnosed with migraine but actually had glaucoma. So, you, wanna, you know, you don't want to send somebody with glaucoma to the headache specialist. It's a good reason to practice your gonioscopy skills. All right, so here are some other uh, headache disorders that may manifest as eye pain. So we've already talked about the primary headache disorders, which is primarily migraine and tension headache. Um, we're going to talk briefly about some of these headache syndromes that can have autonomic features, uh, like cluster and paroxysmal hemicrania. And then we've also briefly touched on some of these other things. We talked, about, we talked briefly about herpes zoster presenting as eye pain early on, being difficult to diagnose before the rash comes up. Temporal arteritis is something that we talk about in another lecture, of course, an important cause of a new head pain in an elderly patient you wouldn't want to miss. Carotid dissection can also present as eye pain, um, again, just because of the way that we're wired up and because the sympathetics that go to the lid and the pupil um, travel up on the carotid artery, these patients can present with a Horner syndrome. And some of these patients with autonomic features to their headaches can also have a Horner syndrome as part of their headache syndrome, and that makes it kind of confusing. Uh, both increased and decreased intracranial pressure can present as eye pain. Uh, we talked about idiopathic orbital inflammation. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about trigeminal neuralgia, because this is another headache syndrome that comes into my comprehensive ophthalmology clinic that's important to recognize, uh, and is and another thing that's you know recognized based solely on the history. And then cervical spine disease can also present weirdly as eye pain or even blurred vision in some patients. So let's talk about this guy. So can anybody see what's wrong with, so he needs a scan, right? Can anybody see what's wrong with him? The brain is sagging through the frame and magnum, yeah. So uh, the frame and magnum runs between the tip of the clivus bone down here and back here to the occipital bone. You can see that the cerebellum is kind of sinking down through the frame and magnum. You see his pituitary is very plump, you know, as opposed to somebody with a pseudotumor who usually has a flat pituitary. He's got a big plump pituitary. And you can see how it looks like the whole cerebellum and brainstem are just kind of being shoved down into the bottom, into the base of the skull. So this is an a imaging picture of intracranial hypotension, which luckily is pretty rare. Um, the key thing are these positional headaches. So like, remember, people with pseudotumor, people with high intracranial pressure, they feel worse when they lie down, better when they stand up. People with hypotension are generally the opposite. They feel better when they lie down. They feel awful when they try to stand up. Uh, they can, just like somebody with hypertension, they can have a sixth nerve palsy. Um, they might have cerebral spinal fluid leakage from their nose or ear. And there's a bunch of risk factors for it. Uh, that's, <clears throat> I mean, lumbar puncture is pretty obvious, head trauma, obvious. Water sports, really? Weightlifting and golf, it's been reported. Sometimes cough can cause a tear in the meninges. Uh, seeing the chiropractor that Dr. Katz sent you to can cause this. Uh, car wreck, yoga, 
and then there might be some genetic predispositions, you know, some of these connective tissue things. Uh, so sometimes people with spasm of, the, of their neck muscles or irritation of the occipital nerve uh, can manifest as eye pain. Um, uh, even blurred vision, especially in association with a whiplash injury. And we're not 100% sure why this is, but a lot of times uh, patients who I'll see who are coming in with eye pain and it doesn't really sound like one of these headache syndromes and their eye exam is normal, I'll kind of feel, I'll ask them if I can feel their neck and you would not believe some of the neck muscles you can feel on people. They're just like rocks. I was like, you know, maybe you should get somebody to look at your neck. And so it's not a completely clear why people with neck stuff get referred pain or referred symptoms into their eye. But I think it's again like that example of somebody having a heart attack and having left arm pain. And it's because the nucleus of the trigeminal nerve dips way down into the upper part of the cervical cord. And so, I, so it, it's possible that irritation of that area is causing referred pain because the trigeminal nerve innervates the eye and the eye socket. That irritation of the trigeminal nerve nucleus can sometimes manifest as visual symptoms or eye pain. Oh, and so, um, so when I see somebody like that, like that's like a great patient to send for physical therapy, right? You know, because sometimes just getting their neck work done. Um, and then, you know, if you want a chiropractor, massage therapy, acupuncture, those things can all be effective. But the nice thing about physical therapy is it's usually paid for by insurance, whereas the other modalities may or may not be. Okay. So here's another example where somebody with a metastatic disease to the, the vertebrae <coughs> comes into the eye doctor with eye pain. And again, it's probably the same mechanism, irritation of the uh, caudal part of the trigeminal nucleus. So hopefully nobody misses this one in this audience. Right? So go directly to IV steroids. Do not pass go. Uh, I'm just, just one slide about giant slarteritis because this is in another lecture. You know, these are older people. Uh, they generally have this kind of chronic, low grade, boring, continuous, holocranial head pain. They can have tenderness over the temporal artery, although not usually in my experience. Uh, we want to act, ask about scalp tenderness. You'd say, is your scalp tender? And they'll be like, what? So usually what we'll say is, when you comb or brush your hair, does that hurt? Uh, they can have PMR symptoms, you know, achy joints and muscles, uh, weight loss, anorexia, uh, anemia, you know, because people with giant slarteritis get the anemia of chronic disease. Jaw claudication is a super specific symptom for giant slarteritis. Like if somebody tells you they're having trouble chewing or swallowing, that, you know, there's very few things that cause that. Now a lot of people have like temporal mandibular joint problems or tooth problems. The way you can distinguish that is that those people, as soon as they start chewing, they're uncomfortable because they're, it irritates their TMJ, it irritates their teeth. But people with jaw claudication, usually when they first start chewing and eating, they're okay. It's after they've been chewing for a few minutes that they get the claudication. So that's a way that you can sometimes differentiate true claudication from some of these other more common uh, mouth and jaw problems. You want to get a complete blood count, a C-reactive protein, not the high sensitivity C-reactive protein. That's for heart. You want just the plain old CRP and a sed rate. Um, uh, and of course, we all know that this can cause blindness and it's not something you want to miss. Uh, let's back up and talk about trigeminal neuralgia because this is something that again will sometimes roll into your general ophthalmology clinic. It's relatively common. It's generally uh, in the older class of people too. The thing that is really, um, uh, you know, pathic mnemonic about trigeminal neuralgia is that it's, it's, it's this unilateral pain that has a sudden, severe, stabbing, electric, jabbing, shock-like quality to it that's really very different from migrainous pain 
or from pain caused by almost any of the other uh, headache syndromes we've been discussing this morning. It's this jab, 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 or zzz, 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 you know, uh, that can be uh, uh, really s severe enough that people like will stay home because they're afraid they're going to have an attack while they're out. Uh, it can sometimes have a constant aching, burning kind of quality to it, but that's much less common. You know, it's really that, it's that neuropathic kind of s uh, sense to it. And it can be set off by shaving, brushing their teeth, being out in the wind, chewing food. Some fairly benign activities can, you know, because of the innervation of the face, can set off these spells of this really severe pain. And it's that characteristic that helps you differentiate it clinically from other things. Um, most, uh, in most cases, it's thought to be due to a uh, blood vessel uh, pushing on the root exit zone of the trigeminal nerve. It can also be associated with multiple sclerosis. The nerve could be compressed by a tumor or an AVM. If somebody could have, have, have had recent surgery that damaged or irritated the nerve in their sinuses, their mouth, stroke, facial trauma, all these things, anything that can injure or, or touch or impact the trigeminal nerve can cause this syndrome. It's generally, um, you know, these people need to be scanned. Um, uh, Tegretol is a great treatment, Neurontin. Um, some of these people need surgery. Sometimes the trigeminal nerve has to be ablated or, uh, or treated in some other way to get it to stop firing because these people have such this horrible intractable pain. And again, this is sort of beyond the scope of what I would expect a comprehensive ophthalmologist to, to deal with. But again, just being aware of what the story sounds like so that you can say, oh, gee, this sounds like trigeminal neuralgia. We need to get you to a neurologist or, or I need to call your neurologist and talk to them about it and you know, get you some treatment and, and get you worked up properly. Uh, so we're going to talk briefly about the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. Um, it's very rare that these patients come into my comprehensive ophthalmology clinic, but I just want you to be aware that this exists, that you've like heard of it. Um, uh, so these include cluster, the hemicranias, and then these two very weird syndromes, uh, sunct and suna, which you know you can read what they what they stand for. But you can see that because of these autonomic symptoms, especially the conjunctival injection and tearing, they might come into the eye doctor because they think that some eye problem might be part of their uh, syndrome. Uh, so cluster headache is also a unilateral pain. It comes on very quickly and is relatively short-lived. It's very severe, very sudden. Uh, people are very agitated, restless. They walk around. They can't sit still. Um, some people call this like a a, a, a suicide pain because it's so severe and so debilitating and so awful. Uh, these patients can also have migraineous symptoms like nausea, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, even an aura, and there can be autonomic features like uh, a Horner syndrome or tearing. Uh, so 90% of patients with cluster will report tearing, the majority report conjunctival injection. You can have nasal stuffiness or, ri or, or runny nose, which is also an autonomic symptom. They can have a droopy lid or eyelid swelling and, or, or a Horner's-like appearance during an attack or even between attacks. Uh, so here's a patient with a little bit of a droopy eyelid and a little bit of a small pupil on the left during a, during a cluster headache. Um, there's a small segment of these patients who have a permanent Horner's even when they don't have an attack. Uh, and there's the number of people that have a Horner syndrome during an attack is kind of a big range there. It's not clear if it's pre or post ganglionic. And some of the other trigeminal autonomic cephalages can also be associated with a Horner syndrome or a Horner like syndrome, but cluster is the classic one. Paroxysmal hemicrania is a syndrome of severe unilateral, orbital, or supraorbital or temporal pain. It can also be short-lived, uh, but it happens multiple times a day, unlike cluster hopefully does. I mean, you can see how it'd be kind of hard to dissociate those two diagnoses because they have a lot of similar features. Uh, but they usually have one of these autonomic symptoms on the same side. And of course, there's no secondary cause. Uh, it's episodic, or it can be episodic or chronic. 
Uh, there's hemicrania continua, which is also unilateral. And the pain is continuous, as the name implies, but it, it fluctuates in severity, but it never goes completely away like cluster or paroxysmal hemicrania. Um, the, the weird thing about this syndrome is that it's um, exquisitely responsive to indomethacin, and that's actually part of the diagnostic criteria. And that's kind of a cool thing, like if somebody, if somebody comes in with unilateral pain like this, um, uh, uh, indomethacin can be therapeutic and diagnostic. Uh, the sunk syndrome is this short unilateral neuralgiform headache with conjunctival injection and tearing. Again, this is unilateral pain with autonomic symptoms, but the weird thing is that these are very short-lived, you know, under two minutes. And it can happen, uh, you know, multiple times throughout the day. And then the pain is associated with one of these autonomic features, sunked. Here's a picture of a guy on the left, you know, between attacks and then on the right during an attack, you can see his eyelid is kind of swollen. He, even his temporal artery kind of looks a little bit swollen in that picture. And there's his eyelids, upper and lower eyelids are both edematous during an attack. Uh, there's a big differential diag um, diagnosis with, with these trigeminal autonomic cephalages because these other horrible things can cause similar features. And so the bottom line is that all these patients need to be imaged to rule out a secondary cause. Uh, you know, the big treatment for cluster is oxygen, although there are other treatments. Uh, preventative, there's a number of preventative therapies. We talked about hemicrania and indomethacin. Uh, sunct is uh, traditionally also treated with indomethacin, but is um, uh, notoriously difficult to treat. And again, I think treatment of these syndromes and even the evaluation of these syndromes is beyond the scope of a comprehensive ophthalmologist, but I think it's important to be aware that they exist, to be aware that they have these autonomic features, to be aware that uh, that, pa that patient may come to you because of those autonomic features. Okay. <laughs> Got just a few minutes to do the quiz. Okay, can I go on to number Okay, and the last one. Okay, we're gonna go over the answers. Migraine can present with eye pain. That was kind of the whole point of the lecture, so that's true. Uh, trochleitis is inflammation of the superior oblique tendon and the trochlea, not the muscle, so that is false. Uh, as we talked about in the, in the case example, uh, intracranial hypotension can present with double vision, 
and of course pseudotumor cerebri, intracranial hypertension can cause a sixth nerve palsy. Uh, so they can both present with diplopia. And that's because, remember, the sixth nerve comes out of the pontomedullary junction, goes up the clivus, and over the top, over through Durello's canal into the cavernous sinus. So if the brainstem moves up or down, it's, I mean, it's a teeny tiny nerve, right? It just innervates one little bitty muscle. And so just any kind of pressure up or down on that teeny weeny nerve can, can cause it to fail. Uh, so that is true. And then it's, of course, the trigeminal nerve that innervates the meninges as well as the eye and the eye socket. Uh, these are both all of the above. Uh, again, that was kind of the point of the lecture. I guess I didn't talk about Tolosa Hunt, but hopefully you remember that from another lecture. And then uh, all, all the autonomic cephalages are called that because of these autonomic um, symptoms, like like a droopy Didn't you lid. See a line that if it's a secondary headache, the only secondary headache up there is to listen. Yeah, I, I I noticed that as I put that up here. I did this. I did the quiz late at night, so this should just say headache syndromes. Which of the following headache syndromes? Oh. Yeah, I should, I'll correct that. Okay, so photophobia. We talked about that briefly. Those are photo, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. These other ones don't exist. And none of those other cells are intrinsically photosensitive. And then it, uh, uh, generally people with migraine like incandescent lights, so the answer there is B, whereas these other things tend to bug people with migraine. And then of course the thing that needs to be ruled out here is a carotid dissection, because you're worried, because he's got ptosis and meiosis, you're worried that he's got a Horner syndrome from a carotid dissection, and that's the thing that's gonna cause a stroke and the thing, like these other things can cause the same symptomology, but the dissection is the thing that's gonna cause a problem in the next 24 hours and needs to be ruled out. Okay, thanks everyone.